Hey, Pastor Dave here. Welcome back to another message on our YouTube channel. Today we are going to be talking about the story of the road to Emmaus. And let me tell you, this is one packed message. So grab a notebook um, and a cup of coffee. We are going to dig into it. And I think uh, this is one of the most riveting messages as I listen back to it uh, that I've done since I've been here at Gwanda Assembly. So looking forward to you hearing it. And um, let's go. I want to open up with a verse from Hebrews. This really is kind of one of those theme verses for our church. Our church is going to be used by God, and this is the vision, this is our mission statement of evolving kind of before you as I bring it to you again and again. And it's, it's forming, and I'm starting to be able to put it into a sentence that is, yes, that's exactly where we're going, okay? So here's the, rough, the, the latest, roughest draft I have for you. Our mission statement will be transforming our lives, changing our lives and lives in the community by planting and watering the Word of God in lives in every situation. So we are going to plant the Word of God in our hearts. We're going to water that. And we're going to plant the word of God in people's lives, sometimes through word, sometimes through deed. And we're going to water that. And we're going to see ourselves and other people moving toward who Jesus is because we understand what his word has said about him. Okay? Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 says, For the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and is discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That scripture says that his word is alive, and it determines what's right and wrong, but also the intentions and your feelings and your thoughts and what drives you or what holds you back. And at the end of the day, it is the word of God before the master himself that we will give an account. Now, good for us that the word of God holds grace and says, if you depend on the blood of the lamb, you will give an account, but your mistakes will be covered by his blood. But you got to know the word to know that. You got to know what a wage is and what a gift is. And you got to know how to build treasures. And you got to know that every attitude and thought of your heart is weighed by the word of God. And he sees you coming. Okay? I am super excited about the story we're going to talk about today. Um, this was actually first mentioned to me um, by Sarah Hammond about a month ago. And it got me to thinking about this story. And it's just a cool story. And we're going we're gonna to touch on it today. So the first picture I want to show you in this message is a banana. Okay. How many know that bananas are not specifically mentioned in the Bible? We can still use them. All right. Let's talk about the journey of a banana. So a banana starts in a more tropical environment than we live in, right? They come in humongous bunches. Like you, if you bought a bunch of bananas at the store, you'd have to have a stock boy put them in your car. And if you had a car like mine, you'd have to go home and get the other car because they, they just grow in huge bunches. But they're grown in a tropical climate, and they don't taste good until they're ripe. I don't think, I don't like green bananas. And if they get too ripe, you can put them in banana bread or still eat them. Once they start getting grainy, put them in the banana bread for me. I don't like them when they get that, that ripe. But the plan is these things grow somewhere else. We don't see them. But we, when we see them at the store, we think, oh, bananas. Banana cream pie, bananas on ice cream, bananas on cereal. If you don't like bananas, I'm sorry. But they are like the worst health food because they're like really sugary and, oh, they're so good. But when you buy them in the store, you're thinking, well, they're a little bit green. We'll give them some time. I'll buy some more ripe ones, some more green ones. We'll wait, and then we'll have bananas for like a few days or in my house like a few hours because my kids like just devour them. But you have... When you see them in the store, a thought process starts of what you're going to use them for. You're going to enjoy the sweet 
strictness of eating them. You have a plan, so you have expectations of what's going to happen in the next few days, week, couple of weeks, what you're going to use them for. What if you cut one open and saw that? Maybe if you love kiwis, it'd be awesome. But if you were going to make banana bread and you opened up bananas and found that, that would be a problem. Because I've never had kiwi bread, but I'm pretty sure it would probably be gross. Right? So if you like bananas because they're not sour and they don't have seeds, this would be a huge disappointment. Okay? This in real life will not happen. But your day and your circumstances in real life often look like this. I want to ask you a question. How many of you, thinking back five years, can say, I'm pretty much exactly where I thought I would be in exactly the situation and circumstances I thought I would be in five years ago? For most people, you can't say that. In any five-year block, you look back and your life is pretty substantially different, at least in circumstances, than you thought it would be, right? I didn't know five years ago I would be the guy standing up here in the front on this day. And I've been doing it for two of the five years, I didn't think that. Five years ago, I thought I would have been probably doing a million dollars a year on eBay and Amazon. I'm doing a grand total of on eBay and Amazon right now. It's just how life goes. And you hear people who are wise in the world say, you have to prepare for change. Expect the unexpected. You have to, be, uh, you have to diversify. You have to be flexible. We know that, but we still make plans. And when things don't happen the way we're expecting them to, we get a kiwi inside of a banana. And it's just like, oh, now what am I going to do? And we start scrambling and wondering why we're in the situation that we're in and what we're going to do from here. And it can be very depressing and sometimes discouraging and it can drain you and put you in a bad spot. Sometimes you can feel that life is blindsiding you, right? Just was having a discussion the other day with somebody and Jesse and I have had this a lot of times. If you are a very detailed person and you want everything measured out ahead of you, this can be a real battle because it can cause you to be a worry wart. And I can do that a lot of times. I was talking to someone this week and they're like, if I can't plan out, if I don't know what comes, I, what's coming, I just feel totally overwhelmed like I'm going to die. And what our brains do a lot of times is if we don't know something, if there's a blank space there, our brain fills it up with monsters. And just knowing that your brain does that is really helpful. Because you can kind of see it coming sometimes, but we still get blindsided, right? And we know the statistic out there that 80% of what you worry about never happens. Probably 90% never happens. You worry about it, but it doesn't happen. The crazy thing about our brain is when we worry about something and then it doesn't happen, our brain doesn't go, I'm going to remember that next time and not worry. Next time, you're sure it's going to happen. That's the one instance where our brains ignore the statistics. Okay. So why am I talking about bananas and kiwi bananas? We are going to go to Luke 24 today and talk about the story of the road to Emmaus. Okay? Now, a little backdrop on the road to Emmaus. This story happens literally the day that the women go to the grave and they find the grave empty. And an angel says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. Right? This is the very day that Mary Magdalene runs into the gardener not realizing he's Jesus. Right? This is the very day that Peter and John run to the grave and John happens to mention in the book of John that he beats Peter there, right? Because he's the younger one, the one that Jesus loves, right? So we have this uh, slightly self-centered, youngest likely disciple, John, who was there and he beat Peter and it's important in the Bible that we know that he beat Peter to the grave, okay? These are all people like us, okay? So this is that day, okay? The story says on that very day, two of them were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It's about like walking from here to Lawton's, which is the little town you drive through. It's the 45 zone that you have to slow down for between here and North Collins. That's actually a town called Lawton's, right? And although our Lawton's lived there, they didn't own it. They just lived there. 
okay, Mark and Jessica Lawton didn't own Lawtons, but it's easy to miss. Now, there, the first thing that I want you to see in this story that you've maybe never thought of or haven't looked into this at all is I picked this picture, which is actually, you can tell, out of a book, and I think this is more accurate than most for a very simple reason. Can you see anything here that you might have, that may be different than what you just immediately pictured on the story of the road to Emmaus? Is there anything you can catch in that picture? This looks like a woman, yeah. right, because I think it probably was, okay? And I'm going to tell you why. As we read this story, you're going to hear a character named Cleopas, okay? Cleopas is very possibly the physical brother of Joseph, like Joseph that raised Jesus, okay? And Cleopas and his wife had a son named James, kind of a cousin, that's the James that we talk about, okay? Let me read the story for you, and then we're going to open it up. We're going to pull a whole bunch of buried stuff out of here, okay? I'm going to back up just a little bit and, and read part of the story after the women uh, see the empty grave. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb... They told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. I'm in Luke 24 if you want to follow along. If you want this to be story time, as long as you don't go to sleep, it's not nap time, it's story time. You can close your eyes and listen and imagine the story, okay? Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb and was beaten to the tomb by John. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Now we know pretty well who Cleopas was. And this says that Mary, the mother of James, was one of the women who went to the grave. So what are the odds that Cleopas came from Emmaus, or that area, to Jerusalem for the Passover without his wife? What are the odds he would be going back to Emmaus without his wife? Very possible that this is Cleopas and Mary walking together. That's why I think this picture is probably the most accurate Probably. We don't know for sure. Does it change doctrine if it wasn't Cleopas and Mary? No. But it could be that this is like Jane's dad and mom. Like she went to the grave, right? They were told by angels at the grave or by an angel, why are you looking for the living? Well, who are you looking for here? He's not here. And they remembered Jesus' words, right? And went back and then everybody said, uh, you're probably dreaming. So who knows what she's thinking on the road? You know, Cleopas might be thinking, I need to get her some medication when we get home. I don't know. And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that, he had, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Notice how he says, saying that they had even 
seen a vision. It's almost like he's saying they came back and they even said that they saw angels. Maybe that's not the tone of voice, but he does say they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels. Some of those who are with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. He was at the table with them. He took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed. And he, and, he has, and he appeared to Simon, and they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now, there are a number of things buried in this story. And I want you to think of this story in context of life. On the good days but especially on the days that don't end up the way you thought they would, or on days following a tragedy or a major bump in the road where you thought a specific thing was going to happen. These two that were walking on the road and the 11 that they had left back in Jerusalem and the whole crowd of people who ends up in the upper room a few weeks later, they all, from Scripture, thought that the Messiah was going to come and liberate them from the power of the Romans and supply for them, and feed them, and change all of life in front of them right there. They didn't understand that he was coming to die for them, and that he would return and set up his kingdom and rule and reign and destroy sin and death and all those things and wipe away every tear when he comes back. So they had, inside of their own faith, some presumptions about what he was going to do and what that would look like that had been crushed or at least disappointed at this point, right? So whether it's a health issue you're dealing with or just something that didn't work the way you thought it was going to and you were sure he told you he wanted to go a certain way. Let me just say that there are times when God prompts you to move in a direction and it may not look for 10, 15, 20 years like that was a good choice. It may never feel like that was a good choice. That does not mean that that was not a good choice. There were choices I made business-wise as a young man that I felt led toward and made. What I have to show for them is an education, not a dollar. But that education is capable of producing influence and lives and potentially dollars in the future. You see, he's teaching us all the time. And just like Karate Kid, sand the floor, paint the fence, wax the car, seems to be a waste of time and like this God who should care is, is using you to get his work done and he doesn't care, he's teaching you things to make you something you're not today for something bigger, a greater cause or the influence in a life to save them for eternity. Okay, let's think of some things that happened in this situation. So this couple is walking, likely disappointed, they're disillusioned. Jesus says, what are you talking about? And they're like, are you the only one who's been in Jerusalem and doesn't have any clue what's going on? We thought this guy was going to save us. We thought he was the Savior. And our, and our leaders delivered him up and killed him. Now, isn't it funny that Jesus himself walking up next to them in their situation 
of despair and pain does not change their situation of despair and change. He chooses to mask his presence in a way that his presence itself is not the answer to their problem. It's not the answer to their grief. His presence in this situation, he chooses to not be the answer. Now, there are times when you'll be battling in life and you will suddenly have a sense of his presence with you and it will change everything. But not always. Not always. Sometimes we pray for comfort when we're learning. And comfort would stop the learning. He's got a plan. The second thing I want to look at here is what if, if he doesn't give them his identity for comfort, what does he choose to give them? Anybody remember what we read? What does he choose to give them? Absolutely. And he says to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He literally is saying, you're downcast because you haven't understood what the Word of God has said. Does the Word of God say, you will always be comfortable, and if you're not, then you've done something wrong and God is mad at you? No. It doesn't say that. Does it say, if you're sick, Something's wrong in your life or someone has cursed your life and you need to pray a demonic oppression off of that. Every time, every time. That's, it doesn't say that. Does the Bible say that there were people who were oppressed with afflictions that was a demonic influence? Absolutely. Does not say every time. Paul himself prays, Lord, will you take this demonic presence that is buffering my life, will you deliver me from this? And what does God say? My grace is sufficient for you, for in your weakness is my strength made perfect. And Paul's response is, I will take pleasure in my infirmities. Because he knows that if he has something wrong with him and it's God's will to heal, and he says, I believe you can heal me and I ask you to heal me, God will heal him. But if it's God's desire to teach him something, in this, even when it is a demonic attack, after two, three times, Paul is, understands from God talking to him, this is something that I'm using in your life. Now, does Jesus himself say, keep asking, keep asking, keep asking? Yeah. In this situation, Paul's on a third time around asking. God says, time out. My grace is enough. In this situation, my strength is perfected in your weakness. Had God not said that, there would have been a fourth request and a fifth request because Jesus said, keep asking. His word dictates our perspective and our reaction. But we got to know it, right? So Jesus, instead of being the all-powerful presence and taking away all their fear and distraughtness and showing them what's supposed to happen just by his presence and telling them, he says, you are distraught and sad because you haven't understood what the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, literally beginning at Genesis and ending in Malachi, because the New Testament had not been penned yet, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now there's a lot to learn, but think about it. He gave them the basic picture from here to Lawton's. I could walk that in a couple hours. It's not like they were walking from here to Nebraska, right? It wasn't a six-week course, eight hours a day on what the prophets had said. It's a fairly basic, super loaded, but fairly basic story. He, he relays it to them in an hour and a half, two hours. Relays the whole story. It's basics, right? So now we're going to fast forward. He walks with them, shares with them all these things. His presence is there. For whatever reason, he chooses for them not to know that his presence is there. I think there's a lesson in this. 
there are times when we are praying to him where he chooses, because of what he's teaching us, not to make us aware of his immediate presence. Was he there? Yes. He was there. He was right there with them the whole time, but chose in his wisdom, in his sovereignty, not to make his presence known to them while they were being shown all the scriptures. Probably what would have happened was they would have been enthralled by him and drug him back to Jerusalem had he let them know who he was. They wouldn't have listened to nothing, right? It's like pulling out the bag of dum-dum pops before the class is over. Just a bad move. Okay, fast forward. So they drew near the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. Isn't it funny how the day wasn't far spent once they had seen him? Oh, they hightailed it back. Day with plenty of daylight left. Once they had seen him and, and he had inspired them, it didn't really matter what time of day it was, they were headed back to the eleven and the others back in Jerusalem. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke, broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. So they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us when all of a sudden he appeared and we knew who he was? Are you following along with me? Because that's not what it says. They don't say to each other, oh my goodness, aren't you so excited? Aren't you so, your heart is on fire now that we've seen him and know that he's alive? That's not what they say. Jesus has just appeared to them and disappears and what do they talk about? Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? What changed their attitudes and their hearts was not him appearing. It wasn't his presence. It wasn't the experience of his presence. Is that extremely powerful in life? Yes. I have tried to make deals with God that he would give me another dream like I've had before where I meet him in a dream. I have sacrificed the Lamborghini dream. I will, I will be okay with it. It's impossible for me to ever have a Lamborghini if you just let me have one more dream. I will be poor the rest of my life. I, I have thought of all different ways that I could try to get him to let me have this experience again because his presence is that, off, is that awesome. Do we find his love in those places? Do we experience his affection for us? Yes. Do we understand how close he is there? Yes. All of those things, I'm telling you, are the frosting of your faith. But the meat of your faith and your experience with him and your understanding of what he wants is in this book. And if the only way you know him is by experiences spiritually and feeling his presence in a worship service, you are going to flail. And your life is going to be one of a believer who wants to eat the frosting off the top of the cupcake and never eat dinner. This is milk and bread and meat. This is what we put in our lives. He wants to give you the Timbits, but you have to eat dinner. He's not a dad that's going to fill you up with frosting. He's just not. He'll give you a taste here and there. Sometimes if he thinks it's going to lure you to himself and open you to get into the Word, okay. But it is not the meat that your, your body is built out of. Is not the, the experience. They're awesome. I love to feel his presence in worship. It's not what our church is built on. It's built on this. And sometimes he does crazy awesome stuff and shows up. But this is the meat. And if you love the experience more than the word, you don't know him. You like him, but you don't know him. So they're inspired by the word and his presence just frosts that over, and now they're on a sugar buzz. They are headed back to Jerusalem. They rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. The crazy thing that I didn't realize until this morning when I came and I was reading over this, I'm going to read the next section to you. 
as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that, I, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to him, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be claimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. What things? These things written in the word. He's not talking about his appearance. Okay? And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. They might have all been headed out in the next couple of days. It wasn't until after Emmaus that he told him to stay and wait for the Holy Spirit, for power, from, for power from the Holy Spirit to come down from on high and empower them. Notice how he appears, but his heart always goes back to, isn't it written in the prophets? Isn't it in the scriptures? You have become witnesses of these things. And he opens their minds so they can understand what the scriptures have said. If you've ever read the story of Stephen being stoned, the first martyr in the New Testament, Paul was there holding coats while Stephen was martyred. When you read that section, my thought every time is, my goodness, this guy goes like on forever. Gives him the whole history of all and Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes and bing, 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 bing. And then, and then tells him, this is the Messiah that the scriptures have told us about and this and that and that and this and you killed him. We don't have any record of any apostle or disciple talking like that at all before this happens. So they're empowered by the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is a witness to and the, inspir and the inspiration of the Word of God. So it wasn't just that nothing changed and all of a sudden on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes in and empowers them and gives them this dynamite power to go out and share he opens their minds to understand the rock, the, the foundation of their lives right here, and then inspires them and empowers them with a boldness to take what he has opened their minds to see out to the world. I want us all to understand that our answer for where we ought to be going and how we should cope with where we are and all the things that life has to offer, our answer is primarily the Word of God. We have to be in the Word of God. If you are praying for an answer from Him, you need something to weigh what you think He's saying against. So if you don't know the Word of God, that's a problem. Have you ever told you where Mormonism came from? a possibly very well-intentioned guy who didn't know this word, who supposedly prays and says, which church should I go to? And the story goes that God told him, none of them, they're all corrupt, and gives him an additional something on to Scripture that has all kinds of, eventually, all kinds of doctrine that is false. And what tells them that what they believe is true is a feeling a burning, it's a, and it's a, what they would call an internal witness of the truth when they pray and ask, is the Book of Mormon true? Is Joseph Smith a true prophet? They pray and they get this feeling. But I've told them, guys, he saw you coming like 1,800 years ahead because he said the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides even to soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it discerns the thoughts and intents of your heart. That word heart literally means middle. Discerning the thoughts 
and intents and feelings and burnings of your middle. The Word of God is living and active, and it will tell you whether or not that feeling is true. Because there are people who are in situations where, God, I'm really just battling, and she's just such a jerk, and I know I married her like 15 years ago, but this other girl over here, oh, we were made for each other. I'm sure you want me to be, God, did I marry the wrong one? Do you really want me to be with this one? The very thought of that is like, oh, that feels so, he's telling me. I missed it and I screwed up, but you know, this is who I was meant to be with. The word of God says, your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. You cannot rely on your feelings to tell you what's right and wrong. The Word of God has told you what's right and wrong. And at the end of the day, He's going to say, I know you, or I don't know you. When I drive by Tim Hortons and I want to stop for a 10 back of Tim Bits, I know what she wants. I know what she's thinking. I don't have to ask her. I know her. That's what it's like. When you know the Word, you know His heart on things. You know what He wants. Right? We have to build on this. As a church, as your pastor, I am committed to this being the foundation of everything we do. Do we do some things good? Yep, we do kids good. We're going to do that more. <laughs> Sorry for making you laugh at that. <laughs> We do children's ministry good. There's other things that we do good that we, we're not, we don't even know for sure yet. But some of you have gifts and you know it that he wants you to use. And as your pastor, I haven't learned to delegate well enough to put you in a spot where you can use them and get excited about using them and make a difference in lives. Sorry. I'm learning. Right? We're going to get there. Right? We're going to have some awesome times. And... There are people sitting here that God wants to use in ways that you know and some of you don't know. You don't have any clue what he's got in store for you. But you're going to see your true identity when you read this. When he says, I'm doing a new thing, do you not know it? When he says to Gideon, hiding in a wine press, brave soldier. He's like, you got the wrong number there, boss. Some of you are thinking that. And he don't got the wrong number. He's got the right number. And he's got your number. We got to know the word. Okay? Every day, pick it up. If it's a verse, chew on that verse. If it's a chapter, fine. But start planting and watering the word of God in your life. The more you do that, the more you'll find yourself picking that seed up and dropping it in other people's lives and watering it, sometimes in word, sometimes in deed. But that's the foundation. As we bring another message to a close, I want to encourage you uh, to think about and chew on what we've gone over today on the road to Emmaus. You know, what we're really hoping to do as a family here at Gwanda Assembly and with you on YouTube, no matter where you're listening from, is to grow. We want to grow in a way that the Bible, the Word of God, is our foundational truth in life and that it penetrates every situation we find ourselves in in a way that changes us and naturally is a light to those around us. So... Um, again, thank you for being here, and feel free anytime to contact us on Facebook or give us a call. Our number at the church is 716-532-5038. Have a super week.